Good afternoon, everyone. We are here uh, gathered to meet our first webinar as a group. It, it is our 76th uh, meetup. Due to the conditions outside, we have to improvise and we uh, are relying our meetups in a remote session. The, this uh, meetup will be called Synthetic Teller Data Generation and will be uh, presented by Fabiana Clement. The agenda is the following. Uh, I will talk a bit and annoy you for 15 minutes. Then Fabiana will uh, explain synthetic tabular data generation again by the Prost. Finally, we have a, a Q&A uh, and then a closing session. The Q&A uh, is special. Uh, I will show you the, the link for Slido and you can uh, write your questions during the presentation of Fabiana and upvote questions that you like. After the presentation, I will select the top uh, 10 questions and do a simple conversation with Fabiana where I ask the questions that are most voted uh, by you. Please do not use the Q&A integrated in YouTube or Zoom as we'll rely on Slido to have the final questions. First of all, I want to present the group, Data Science Portugal. We are an informal community made by all type of persons. I myself, I'm a researcher. I work in the University of Aveiro, but we also have hobbyists, that people that in, in their homes want to try data science and people that work in the industry, all kinds of industry. Uh, we gathered uh, from 2016 as a small community and you want to promote synergies between uh, data science people regarding their background. They, you can be a beginner trying to work uh, with that in home. You can be an academic and you want to do a research based on data science and you can do an industry leader and want to use machine learning for profit. We are currently located in five cities right now, Aveiro, Braga, Coimbra, Lisboa and Porto. And there are teams delegated in each city that uh, organize meetups, other events, uh, and you can find us in social media in our site, datascienceportugal.com, where you find a lot of events that are related to data science organized by us or other data science uh, communities. And you can also find job opportunities, our contacts directly, and if you want to sponsor one of events made by us. Furthermore, we are uh, you have this following uh, social uh, meet, social uh, networks. We have a strong presence in Slack, where daily we talk with uh, the community, not only the events, but also issues that people have. You also have a presence in Facebook, Meetup, and LinkedIn. So join us if you want to know more about data science or want to share the knowledge that you already have. We have a call for proposals. If you want to propose a speaker or if you want to show the data science project that you have working on, please use the following links to contact us. Uh, I will present the next event. The next event organized by us, Data Science Portugal and this Data Science for Social Good will be uh, also a webinar and is named Curating a COVID-19 Data Repository Styles and Technic Technicalities. We will be given by Paulo Maia and he will, the data is May, May 7. We also have partner events. In June 2, we have uh, Jota Nation where data, data Science Portugal was involved in the track of machine learning. And we also have, we also uh, are the partner for communication for Visium Summer School. We have uh, now a quick questions free from us, Data Science Portugal, and several others from our uh, speaker. So you have a pool right now, you can answer honestly because this is anonymous. Please answer in a truthful way. Thank you. 
I will uh, wait a little more for the, the replies from everybody. I also fill my questionnaire. Here you find the hashtag for Slido, DSPT76. Please, during the presentation, go to there and ask honest questions regarding the, the presentation. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to present Fabiana Clement. She has studied applied math and data science. She has been working from big companies such as Vodafone and Novabas, and, and from, uh, from big companies such as Vodafone and Novabas to startups, and is one of the co-founders of Ipsom Data that generates synthetic data based on real data to, so companies can work on before having reliable data sets or curated data sets. So I will pass the word to Fabiana that will present a synthetic tabular data generation again based approach. You can steal the, the video for you, please. Yeah, give me just a sec. Sure. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, I think now everyone can see my screen, right? Uh, so I will start to present myself. My name is Fabiana, uh, and as Mario um, presented me and well, I'm YData's co-founder and chief data officer. And today I bring you synthetic tabular data generation, a can based approach. So my academic background is in applied maths and data science. Throughout my career, I've worked from big uh, enterprises as well as startups, uh, mainly in projects related with data science and data solution architecture. Uh, besides data science in general, my main interests are related with uh, time series and generative models. So let's kick off. <laughs> As I've mentioned before, today we are here to talk about generative adversarial nets, a use case of synthetic tabular data generation. But to start, uh, I will first clarify what generative after all means. A generative can be described as a class of models that contrast with the discriminative ones. Let me give you a more concrete example. In a classification problem where we want to classify whether the characteristics belong to a dog or a cat, the generative model will build the model for those who look like cats and then builds the model for those who look like dogs. Whereas the discriminative would rather define a decision boundary that separates what is a dog and a cat. Formally speaking, this means that Given a set of data instances, X, and a set of labels, Y, generative models capture the joint probability of X and Y, or just probability of X, if there are no labels. Whereas discriminative models capture the conditional probability of Y knowing X. A generative model includes the distribution of the data itself and tells you how likely a given example is. Let's say, models that predict the next word in a sequence are typically generative models, as they are able to assign a probability of a sequence of words. A discriminative model ignores the question of whether a given instance is likely, and just tells you how likely a label is to apply to the instance. Of course, this is a very, uh, general definition of generative models, but I think it will serve for the purpose of today's meetup. Well, 
As I mentioned, there are many generative models. Here I'm presenting uh, a symptom, a taxonomy of the generative models, and that can be either implicit or explicit. They aim to learn uh, the true data set distribution that is present. Um, the two most commonly used approaches from this list, uh, as you probably have heard already, are the variational autoencoders and the generative adversarial nets. Although Markov chains have been also widely used in the industry, such in machinery, energy production, distribution, etc. But as I mentioned, today we will focus on these folks, the generative adversarial nets that I'll be covering forward in this presentation. So, generative adversarial nets were introduced in 2014 as a novel way to train a generative model, meaning to create a model that is able to generate data. I might be repeating this to some of you in the audience, but for others, I think this is an important background. These new deep generative models consist of two adversarial models that compete with each other. The generative model, the generator, captures the data distribution, while the discriminator estimates the probability of a sample being real or fake. This is a min-max game, and why? Well, because the discriminator tries to maximize the objective while the generator tries to minimize it. GANs are widely used to generate images from scratch, but they can also be used to generate sound, speech, text, and so on. Besides data generation, GANs have a bigger scope of application. In the next slides, I will cover some of its applications that I enjoy the most. Well, there are a couple of simple web applications that you can check where real looking human faces uh, are generated with GANs. Here, I brought you the, this person doesn't exist. But you can also have other options such as the this cat doesn't exist or even the this horse doesn't exist. Well, you have plenty of choice, it's up to you. On the right side, you have another use of GANs. In this case, it is no longer the case of creating real looking persons or cats, but to generate an anime character from a selfie. The results are quite impressive and each of the animes featured are resultant from different GANs architectures. One of them I'll be covering next. If you want to check out what you would look like as an anime, you can just check this GitHub project. I really recommend that to you. So, as I mentioned, we are going to start talking about pics to pics or image to image. This is a GAN architecture that uses a conditional generative adversarial net to be able to learn the mapping from an input image to an output one. Here, the discriminator is looking at the generator's real cats and trying to learn to tell the difference between the cats of the generator and the true cat images provided in the training set. The challenge to achieve good results with this architecture is rather on the side of the training data. The two images spaces that we want to learn to translate between needs to be pre-formatted into a single XY image that helps tightly correlated both images, as we can see here, for example. This process can be very time consuming and even impossible sometimes, based on what two image we are looking to translate. But still, the results can be quite amazing, don't you think? But this is where it comes the cycle gang, which to be honest, is one of my favorites. The key idea behind cycle GANs is that they allow you to point the model at two discrete and unpaired collections of images. A bit different from pix to pix requirements, 
CycleGAN model can learn to translate the images between these two aesthetics without the need to merge tightly correlated matches together into a single XY training image. The way cycle GANs are able to learn such great translations without having explicit X and Y training images involves introducing the idea of a full translation cycle to determine how good the entire translation system is, thus improving both generators at the same time. Of course, here I'm oversimplifying the problem behind it. But the objective was more to share with you different applications and results while leveraging adversarial losses. Now that we have already a pretty good idea and an overview on what are generative adversarial nets and generative models, let's now focus on the topic that brought us here together today, generating Trevlar synthetic data, again, based approach. With the recent advance in the GANs field, such as learning the transfer properties as we have seen in the last slide, it becomes very tempting to apply them to problems in data science tasks. A lot of the data involved in data science tasks includes dealing with multiple continuous and categorical variables, sometimes even time-dependent ones. But training nets with these types of inputs raises additional challenges that we will cover over the course of this next slides. Before jumping again into GANs, <laughs> I will cover what is synthetic data after all, and for what is it, is it used? Probably a lot of you, in particular those who are already in the data industry, have a pretty good idea about what is synthetic data. Well, we can define synthetic data as any data that is not collected or derived from real data uh, events. This is a very simplistic way to explain it, of course, but I think it will work for today. <laughs> Small data sets, or even for example, imbalanced classes are problems that ourselves as data scientists, we have already dealt with, and we have already found them in our daily tasks when dealing with it. And we have probably even thought about a few methods that we can suggest to solve these kind of problems. A lot of those methods do produce synthetic data although we don't call it like that. The first one, you are, you are pretty familiar, I bet. The SMOTE and Datasyn that are widely used uh, algorithms for oversampling and handling highly imbalanced data sets. Some multivariate statistical based methods to model multivariate distributions. And in some cases, agent-based simulations. The, these last ones are widely used, for example, to model events such as uh, earthquakes. We'll, we'll now that we all know what it is, and as it is pretty much the same as real data, or let's say it is, why do we need synthetic data? Well, there are many reasons, but there are three on top of my mind. The new private regulations such as GDPR in Europe or CCPA in California are raising new concerns and measures to be taken by organizations. Sharing data has never been an easy task and either for big organizations or even between parties. And now it has gotten even more challenging. Finally, Traditional anonymization tools are not enough anymore, as it is easy now to de-anonymize hashed or masked data. All of these concerns are valid for organizations, but as a data scientist, why should I use synthetic data? Well, for plenty of reasons, not only for those four I'm presenting here. Those reasons can include that your organization, for example, lacks of data, and instead of dropping projects or making rudimentary augmentations that will lead 
maybe to a project failure, you could accomplish the project with synthetic data. It is also valid for balancing data sets and labeling data. This is really important because the process of acquiring data and labeling it is quite time consuming and expensive. And last but not the least, I'm sure that everyone has already experienced this. You need data for your project, but there are plenty of asks and authorizations to be made. Months go by and finally, when you get your data, you might realize that the project is not possible. I've been there and I've done that. So synthetic data in a nutshell allows data science teams to have a fast access to data and validate the project feasibility without dependencies on other teams. So now that we are all in the same page about synthetic data, let's go back to GANs. Uh, I will here share two architectures that can be used, for example, to generate synthetic data. Probably for those that have already worked in image generation, you have heard a lot about this architecture, the DCGAN, or Deep Convolutional Generative Adversarial Net. It is known for being one of the most popular and successful designs for GANs and uses convolutional strides and transposal convolutions for the downsampling and upsampling. Although it's widely used for images, in order to be used successful and to have good results with tabular data, some changes were made to its original architecture. For example, uh, it was necessary to have an auxiliary discriminator, and you might be asking why. This new classifier is responsible for keeping the semantic consistency of the generated records. A simple but effective example of the need of such auxiliary networks is, for example, to prevent that a record belonging to a male has a disease of type breast cancer, for example. Its architecture is the same as a discriminator, as we can see, but with a slight difference concerning the sigmoid function output. In this case, the output of the auxiliary classifier does not just do discriminates between real or fake, but rather between the different labels that are available in our data set. This, uh, the adding of this auxiliary classifier can improve the overall generated records quality significantly. But there, there is a funny thing, or at least I, it might sound funny for some of you, but it's very important for you to take uh, in consideration when using this architecture. The way and the shape you pass the input data is very important and might have a huge influence on the synthesization final results. For example, a record that consists of 24 values can be converted in a 5 to 5 matrix after filing. Other options, for example, includes to input records in the original vector format and perform 1D convolutions. However, its synthesization performance is suboptimal due to its limited convolutions computations. And this is very important if you are looking for high quality when generating synthetic data. The other one, the Wasserstein GAN, and sorry if I'm not pronouncing in the right way, <laughs> has brought some changes to the vanilla GAN architecture. Well, generally the architecture includes both a discriminator and the generator, but the major differences can be described as uh, the introduction of a new loss function. This function is now based uh, in the Wasserstein plus one, uh, minus one distance. In this case, the output loss of the discriminator is no longer the probability of being real or not, but rather a score in the domain. It is not rare to see the discriminator in this architecture to be called critic instead, for example. 
Also, the optimization problem is now constrained by a Lipschitz function, which was made possible by clipping the weights of the discriminator. And last but not the least, the usage of an alternative optimizer. In this case, instead of using, for example, the, other op the Adam optimizer, due to its momentum convergence problems, we are using RMS prop. Overall, the Wasserstein generative adversarial nets, it's an extension of the original GANs that improves the model training stability and provides a loss function that correlates with the quality of the generated data. It is important and one of the most used extensions of the GAN models where the discriminator, instead of predicting the probability of a synthesized record being real or fake, scores the realness of a given record instead. There are some WGAN variations that have shown to improve overall the synthesization results. For example, WGAN with applied gradient penalties or the conditional WGAN. Well, next let's cover um, some results obtained while using GANs and apply to generate tabular synthetic data. Uh, I have applied different GANs architectures, in this case to the minority class present in the chosen data set. This data set you can find easily in Kaggle. It's a very well known for credit fraud. Um, the architectures that I've used here were both vanilla GAN and the conditional GAN. Other architectures, for example, the ones that I've showed previously, the DC GAN and WGAN can also be applied. Um, so this, as I mentioned, is a credit fraud data set. And this data set only contains numerical input variables, which are the result of a PCA transformation. The only variables that haven't suffered any transformation, and in this case, haven't passed through a PCA transformation were time and amount. This data set in particular, it's highly unbalanced with this number of non-fraudulent versus fraudulent events, meaning that under then 1% of the records of the total records corresponds to a fraudulent transaction. Overall, in this data set, we cannot find any missing value. Other aspects to take in consideration is the fact that some of the variables present here have high skewness. Amount is one of them. But for that reason, some preprocessing was required. In this case, the application of a log transformations over some of the variables or to apply the normalizations to, to the full data set, for example. All of this exercise will be made available online. You can check, I will send you the links afterwards. So I will keep you posted through the DSPT Slack with all of this information, okay? So here are the specifications for the vanilla again that I've used. The used architecture have both a generator composed by four dense layers and the discriminator with also four dense layers. In the plot shown in the left, we have compared uh, the real fraudulent versus the generated fraudulent events through the course of 500 training epochs. It is important to remember that this, that this was a very brief exercises and we have not performed any kind of hyperparameter tuning. Next, uh, I'm presenting here in this slide the specifications for used for the conditional GAN. The use architecture have a generator composed by four dense layers and also a discriminator with four dense layers. In this case, we have the labels input that were computed through a K means um, algorithm. In the plot shown in the left, we have compared also the real fraudulent events versus the generated fraudulent events through the course of also 500 training epochs. It is important to remember 
that in this brief exercise, again, we have not performed any kind of hyperparameter tuning, which can be quite important when generating synthetic data. Both uh, the networks here have used the same learning rate, but in the literature, it was found that it's beneficial to use different learning rates assigned to the generator and the discriminator. So um, now comparing both the results of uh, the results of both um, architecture. Here I have trained each can for 5,000 rounds and examined the results a long way. The figure on the left depicts the actual fraud data and the generated fraud data from the different GAN architectures as training processes. Progress. Progress. We can see the actual fraud data divided into the two k-means classes plotted with two dimensions and best tech discriminate these two classes. The GAN that made no use of the class information, that is the, the vanilla GAN, and it generated output all as one class. Both the conditional architecture and the actual fraud data show their data per class, as you can see the actual and the conditional one. We can see that the original GAN architecture starts to learn the shape and range of the actual data, but then it collapses in towards a very small distribution. We'll discuss a bit about the mode collapse forward in this presentation. The generator has learned a small range of the data that now the discriminator has hard time detecting as fraud. That is what we can see here. The conditional GAN architecture here does a bit better um, spreading out and approaching the distributions of each class of the fraud data but then it collapsed, as we can see in the, the last step of the training. The figure depicted on the right side is the statistical difference between the actual and the synthetic fraudulent events generated by the conditional GAN at the 500 uh, epoch. Statistically, they are quite similar, but there are other kind of validations that could also be applied to measure, for example, the quality of this new generated data, comparing, for example, the performance of models trained on the synthetic data and now afterwards applied on the real data. These are the so-called trained synthetic threat test real. It is important to remember that in this data set, almost all of its variables have no correlation between each other as they were a result of a PCA transformation. So here you are dealing with much less correlations. These results let us know the potential of GANs to generate synthetic data. Nevertheless, there are some challenges that are specific to data and others to GANs that I will be covering in the next two slides. So, although image generation, it's not an easy task, Generating tabular data can be extra challenging. Tabular data usually contains a mix of discrete and continuous columns. And a lot of the existing statistical and deep neural net models fail to properly model this type of data. GANs offer high flexibility in modeling dataset distributions as well as the statistical counterparts. But there are some aspects that we need to have in consideration when modeling tabular data. A lot of the challenges that I'm going to share here today are pretty much familiar to many of you that are data scientists. First, the presence of various data types such as integers, decimals, categories, time, text, breadth. Real-world tabular data consists of mixed data types. To simultaneously be able to generate the mix of discrete and continuous columns, GANs must apply both softmax and tangent on the outputs as activation functions. Second, a lot of the categorical variables, in particular those who high, with high cardinality, so dealing with this can be quite tricky. 
Training nets with categorical outputs raises additional challenges. First, because layers sampling from discrete distributions are often non-differentiable, which makes it impossible to train nets using back propagation. But we already know a few methods that we can apply, such for example, one docket encoding. But all of them have their pros and cons when applied to data, which in some cases, it might end up resulting in discarding useful information about the structure of the data. So one hot encoding on top of very high cardinality categorical variables can lead us to a real problem and a very low quality in terms of the, the generated synthetic data. Third, different shapes of distribution. So we might be dealing with multimodal mode uh, variables, long tails, non-Gaussian variables, and so on. Well, of course, uh, besides the fact that different variables have different scales, and for the, that reason, they usually need to be or normalized or standardized or whatever, the choice of the applied transformations will have a direct impact in the use activation functions. Also, in specific about non-Gaussian distributions, in images, pixels values follow a Gaussian-like distribution, which can be easily normalized to a, an interval of minus one to one using a min-max transformation. We have usually, for example, activation functions at the tangent that can be employed in the last layer of a network to the output. But in the case of continuous values in tabular data that are usually non-Gaussian, min-max transformation can lead to the vanishing gradient problem, for example. Then, Another problem that is very common is the, also the missing values present. So presence, uh, have in mind that you cannot train again if you have missing values, you have to process that. And last but not the least, to deal with high imbalanced data sets. This can create a severe mode collapse. Missing a minority cat category only causes tiny changes to the data distribution that is hard to be detected by the discriminator. Imbalanced data also leads to insufficient training opportunities for these minority classes. Well, these are the general challenges that we can find in the data sets, but there are others, of course, and some of them particular to time dependent sets. But it's impossible to cover, cover all of them in a single session. Besides the specific uh, tabular data, challenges, there are some other challenges particular to GANs. We know that GANs are extremely hard to train as they can get very unstable during the training. Also, they can suffer from mode collapse, which means that they might miss to fit some of the modes of the input data. And finally, sometimes uh, we have to deal with their non-convergence. For that, there are uh, specific types of techniques. And I, I brought you some also, besides those techniques, I brought you some of the interesting topics about GANs that if you feel curious enough, you can have a look at it. For example, in what concerns the GANs training stability, there are tricks that can help. For example, uh, the choice of the loss, loss function can impact a lot the stability of the GAN. Also, the hyperparameter tuning and correct selection of GAN architecture can solve or help to solve this problem. Here is very interesting, um, this tool uh, that was open source from Google's VZA that can be used for hyperparameter tuning. Uh, I, I will leave the link here. Also, uh, the application of gradient penalties can also help depending on the selected architecture. And again, loss function. I'll leave you here also some interesting articles about it. And last but not least, and for me, one of the most interesting, the use of coevolution for generative adversarial nets. In what concerns of avoiding mode collapse, you have the packing, which means that this is a method that was suggested with the pack again, but rapidly have extended to other GANs applications. 
the main idea of this method is to modify the discriminator to make decision based on multiple samples from the same class. Either they are real or artificial generated. The other it's, for example, the unrolled GAN that is also here. If, again, you are curious enough, uh, GANs are not only uh, used to generate synthetic data as a whole, they can also be used to input missing values. You have here one article about it as well, which is the GAN. This is a specific GAN architecture to input missing values. There are other interesting topics around GANs that can be explored. A lot of the things are still being explored regarding these nets, and every day new articles are published about this topic. To wrap up this presentation, let me share with you a concrete example of the application of our solution as data. Currently, we are working in creating synthetic ECG signals, so the privacy of the source of patients is protected. Plus, there's also the need to augment the original data source. To be able to classify and identify anomalous cardiac rhythms, excessive amounts of labeled data are required, as well as a balanced data set for all the existing classes. The privacy in these particular cases, it's very hard to be ensured just through the use of traditional anonymization tools. And what concerns balancing the data set, upsampling the anomalous classes using additional sampling tools can lead to highly biased models. And the downsampling of the majority classes can lead to losing a lot of information from the regular class. For that reason, the use of wide data solutions um, allows ECG data to be reproduced in a larger scale while balancing it and transforming it in a shareable data set in a privacy preserving manner. These are some of our results. As you can see on the left, we have some line plots where we compare both the real and the synthetic ECG signals. The blue lines correspond to the synthetic, whereas the violet to the original data. On the right, we have used the DTW, average DTW metric to understand the similarity of the generated ECG series. The results shared here were achieved with the MIT Arrhythmia dataset, of course, due to privacy concerns. And well, that's all. Thank you very much for your attendance. Feel free to reach me out. You have my contacts here. Uh, and I think we still have time for a couple of questions. Thank you. Can, can you stop sharing so our image go side to side? Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, but first, I want to ask Rui to show us the questionnaire. Oh, so everyone should see the, the, the questionnaire pop up. 61% uh, is, is uh, regarding the, the scientist. Almost 80% are Portuguese. Deep learning, 40% have tried in the past with GANs. 67% are curious about it. As a data size, how much time do you spend on data processing tasks? Uh, 50 to 75%, that is accurate, I think. In which uh, ML life cycle files you struggle the most? Data acquisition, they also vote this. Um, which type of data are you most familiar with? Tabular data and time series, that is a close second. Do you have your pyjamas on? No. I think the last one uh, isn't correct, but oh well. So I have here the questions. We printed it. I'm, I have a card. <laughs> so the first one, <clears throat> consider the following context. Classification project with tabular data and severe unbalanced amongst classes. Can GAN be an, an alternative to something like SMOOT? 
Yeah, can be an alternative to something like smooth. I would say yes, but of course, uh, I need a bit more details. For example, if you tell me that your severe unbalance is that you only have two to five records, for example, of that very, very uh, rare class, to use GANs in this case, uh, it's an issue. Um, you don't have enough uh, data in, in that uh, specific case to, to, to generate. But in a lot of cases, and there are some articles really interesting about this, uh, you can apply again to, to small data sets uh, and use uh, them to augment your data set, uh, just like you would with uh, an algorithm as smooth, um, and improving the overall results. The question here that I would make, um, and this is just a word of advice, GANs are quite tricky um, and and sometimes it's just to obtain if that plus one or two percent of accuracy um, is not what you are looking for, I, I would suggest to go for an adesine or a smooth kind of algorithm right away that probably uh, you are a lot familiar with. Of course, it will depend a lot on the complexity of that data set specifically. And you might tell me that Smote is not giving you the results that you are expecting. Yeah, I have a follow-up mm -hmm. question. It's not in, in the, the card, but I will ask it. Um, mm -hmm. how, how much data do you require, for, imagine, for each class for your method to work correctly? Well, it, it depends a lot, um, especially on the problem. But uh, I already have had good results with something so little as uh, 500 uh, events. But usually, for example, in those cases, privacy is an issue, OK? With 500 events, uh, you cannot ensure privacy of the, the synthetic data that you are generating. You will end up generating some, some hackers very, very similar. To, use synthetic data in order to ensure privacy, I would rather recommend something. And this is an estimative, it can be more or sure. less, uh, but I would suggest something like 30,000. Uh, and finally, in the same lines, do your method is able to create some data that is, for example, missing? I, I have two classes, but I don't have the, the middle ground where they are intersecting because I didn't take, acquire them. I know that this part of it exists. I simply didn't find it yet. Because in the beginning of the projects, I don't have data collection working at full speed. So it's how, how good is it to predict data that I haven't seen yet? Uh, yeah, that requires different architecture to be achieved, to okay. be honest. And the, the, um, the way you can achieve it's quite different from the, the architectures it's not quite different. It's a bit different from the architectures that you use to synthesize. But GANs are quite good in achieving good results for uh, things that you haven't collected. For example, uh, there is a case that, uh, if I can recall cor cor correctly, imagine that you have a lot of white individuals that have used something. And you have also like uh, an African American individual that used something similar, but not real equal to, and you are missing that one specific event that you want to know. GANs are able to generate that for you, for example. So you can create even new views and aspects or of the world, even though you have never collected something like it. So they are quite powerful and quite good to be used to extend your data and especially to, well, to deal with cases that you were not even able to collect. Okay, thank you. So next question, is it possible to apply GANs for that documentation in uh, NLP tasks? Well, it is. On my specific particular experience, I've never done that, but it is indeed. So, so I cannot detail a lot about it. 
NLP is not my field of work, but I strongly suggest you to go ahead and search because it is possible. And in, in some cases that are used. Have in mind that generative models that are not GANs can also be used for this particular uh, kind of um, task. And I've mentioned some of them. Even LSTMs can be used for this, or uh, for example, variational autoencoders. Just have a look. There are plenty of, of information around the well, publications about it. But, but yeah. So in short, yes, you, you yes. can use GANs. <laughs> exactly. So next one, how do you evaluate, measure the quality of the generated synthetic data? Well, this is a wildly debated question about synthetic data, but there are many ways, of course, you have the traditional visual ones that you can, you can just go ahead and do apply a PCA or a TSNE over your synthetic data, your original and compare the distributions one uh, on top of the other. You have distance metrics such as the, the Euclidians and others that can be used. Of course, bear in mind that Euclidean distance sometimes is not the, the, the best. Uh, it depends on the use case that you are dealing with. It's very important. You can check the correlations if the, they, they are kept between the synthetic and um, the real ones. But uh, of course, if you want to use your data for data science purposes, uh, the one that is the, the strongest one is the test synthetic test reel, uh, train synthetic test reel and train reel test synthetic. Those are uh, those two methods for me are the most powerful to ensure that your synthetic data uh, it's um, valid. On okay. How to deal with a data set that has both numerical and categorical variables? Again. Well, that is part uh, of the presentation. I know <laughs> but it was voted. <laughs> but short story, uh, it has a lot about pre-processing and also the loss functions that you select at the end of your GAN architecture. So, so to make, make this question more interesting, does it make it harder to converge to have both types? It makes, uh, especially to be honest and uh, very short. And I think a lot of people have the same pain even in the, the science kind of tasks. Categorical variables can be a pain and a very a huge pain in terms of um, ensuring the, the relationships uh, in existing between the variables, the different variables. So yeah, a lot of categorical variables, especially with high cardinality can be the ones more challenging and data sets more challenging to deal with. But of course you then have to deal with uh, long tails uh, in the continuous as well, or sometimes you can just have high skewness that can also um, implicate less good results in the end. But yes, when you have both, it's harder. Do you conceive a, a model where you have two GANs, one for categorical and one for non, uh, for numerical data, and they somehow communicate and synchronize? Yes, it, it, it is possible, that kind of architecture. It's just a way, and, and yes, uh, uh, not disclosing, but usually when you want to have more um, challenging data sets, usually to use an architecture that is more complex and bear in mind that you can have architectures with three uh, generators and discriminators can be used and should be used, for example. Okay, and exactly for the, the point that you have mentioned, you, you want to augment the signal or get better results for categoricals and continue separately. You can have it and I strongly advise to follow that. What kind of metrics can we implement to test how close we are to underlying distributions of our original data? Well, th that is more or less the same question about the, um, the quality that I've, that I've explained before. So, 
yeah, you can you can test the distributions, you can check the distributions, apply some statistical. Um, but in your uh, opinion, you should test it with. Uh, yeah. I strongly advise for that, okay. unless you are not looking for to use the synthetic data for data science purposes. But if you are looking for that, yes, I strongly advise to go for the test synthetic, train synthetic test, real train real test synthetic. At the beginning of an, oh, this is similar to other, but I will ask it again. At the beginning of an ML project, usually the data that's available is scarce. How much data is required to learn a reliable synthetic data generator? Well, yes, exactly. It's a short answer. It will highly depend on the use case, but you can start as little with 500 records. But again, if you want to guarantee privacy, have bear in mind that you cannot work with so little and GANs, okay? A follow-up question in this, in your, <clears throat> not GANs itself, but in your product, do you usually start with a small data set as the team is able to acquire more and more? Do you improve your generator? If you can disclose that. Sorry, sorry. Uh, imagine that you sell your product and you mm -hmm. work with a little bit of data Mm -hmm. hundreds of records, mm -hmm. but as the, the acquisition team is able to acquire more data, mm -hmm. do you reconstruct your generator, your synthetic generator to be able to provide more or at that point your product is uh, not necessary at, anymore? At this moment we are not working with um, neither things like transfer learning or online learning, so yes, we have to reconstruct it for now. Okay. Uh, is uh, the DL-generated data truly anonymized or it can potentially be decoded by other TL networks? Well, uh, synthetic data, let's uh, say synthetic data, it has proven to be much more uh, safe uh, just uh, when compared with um, masking and ashing, for example. But bear in mind, this is a question that is a not a yes or no. It will depend on a lot of uh, variables. For example, the amount of data available to train the, the deep learning net, plus um, the amount of data you are generating on the other side as well. That also impacts. So uh, it's a trade-off. And privacy, it's always a trade-off. Even if you use uh, a gnashing, a masking, or even differential privacy, this is always a trade-off. The more uh, reliable and close to the real data, the less uh, privacy you will ensure. And likewise, the more privacy you want, the less um, look alike with the real data you will end up. So it's not a yes or no answer. Uh, I have a follow-up question because they are so similar, I want to jump them. How can we ensure GAN is not leaking private information if you don't well, believe you're a learner? Uh, Yes, you can you can test, and there are um, um, and there are tests about it. You can attack the guns to check whether they are not uh, whether they are leaking or not uh, information about the 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 data itself. That is a way, and that's the way you should always check if your guns are leaking or not. But that same question is valid for. Uh, the model. inside training inside of organizations and the APIs that are already somehow available online about the organization's data. Those probably are even less secure than GANs. And do you have any method to deal with fingerprinting entities, users, or records in your uh, product? I'm not totally sure if I got the question, to be honest. Yeah, I think fingerprinting is uh, based on a record. Or yeah. Is being to identify the user. Ah, no, yes, that's for sure. That's, yes, we, we, we do have, yes. So I think these are all the security questions made in the... <laughs> People are, are concerned about security right now. No, it's true. And it's a, it's a very valid point, to be honest. But they still share 
everything they did do in a social network. So the exactly. world balance itself. <laughs> Completely. And to be honest, uh, in a, some part, you have to accept that you're not longer 100% private. Of course, you can battle to have as much as your information private, because after all, there are some things that are very sensitive to be disclosed publicly, sometimes in terms of health, or even if you are at home or not, those are things that you might want to keep private. But in a nutshell, if you are in social nets and so on, you already accepted that you have, you are less private. Or a less private person. Unfortunately. Do you believe this could be a viable strategy to anonymize mobility data, say movement data from phones while keeping a similar structure when they created? Yes, that is also possible. That is also possible. It has proven to be a very good method, uh, either for augmenting that data set or even to keep um, travels or uh, well, mobility data and movement data uh, as private as possible. Uh, now, if this question is related with, for example, uh, the tracking devices because of COVID and so on, uh, if that's related, well, unless that data is to be analyzed, and I would suggest synthetic data for data scientists that want to explore that kind of data, if it's about uh, not saving the data of the COVID apps, for example, I think there are other uh, solutions there are far more interesting for example the the i think the app from google and Facebook, google and apple they are developing together that uses federated uh, technology in order to ensure that your data does not leave your your phone are far more interesting uh, i have a follow-up question related to this I, I work a little bit with the telecommunications one way that they scramble data is if i have um, mobility data in my phone and i'm close by to other person she shares a little bit of their mobility data and i share a little bit a randomized okay. little bit of my mobility data so our time series doesn't make sense because we jump mm -hmm. a lot around mm -hmm. how do you think that your solution will fare against this the typical way that our uh, mobile phones do right now. Better, yeah. less, at least our is inexpensive in terms of resources. They just, they just send the packet, say, from this to these timestamps, replace yours with this and give me yours. No, I, I think that that case, it's very interesting to be applied because I don't see it as a problem of just generating synthetic data as a pure problem. Um, but I think it could be very interesting to explore. I'm not sure uh, if I can tell you it will be perfect, but I bet it will give very interesting results. Next question. How do you present the criteria's, uh, so sorry. How do you, how do the present criteria apply to different time series? Okay, uh, about time series specifically. So the architecture that I've presented today, none of them will have good results for time series, okay? Or at least they will give you something, but they will heavily depend probably on the preprocessing that you apply. For time series, uh, and that's a whole other topic about it, um, you have to go for a different architecture that relies on uh, getting the correlations in time between the, um, the, the autocorrelation present in the data set itself. Those architectures usually come with challenges. Again, you have multivariate time series that can have uh, non-variant uh, variables, some variant variables. You have to have that in consideration as well. Uh, it will probably be architecture more based in the use of um, recurrent neural nets, for example, which are more suitable for that task. Not, not the only ones, because you now have the temporal convolution nets that are also quite interesting to be applied in this case. But yeah, there are several challenges that I didn't touch today. Uh, so if you are looking to synthesize time series data, uh, I would suggest to explore other architecture. 
it's another time of peace and maybe another type of talk that you can provide to us maybe, maybe. <laughs> are transfer learning solutions also available here well i covered that one to be honest uh, there are but not in the solution that we are developing do you consider apply it to your uh, project in the future or i think it might bring uh, a lot of benefits especially with when dealing with uh, small data sets and data sets in the same around the same scope it example. appears a good selling point to small exactly. companies exactly what about self-supervised learning has it been successful applied to games well, self-supervised learning, it's very interesting and uh, I've seen some uh, applications of it, not the, the use cases that we are exploring, of course, but you, if I got the, the question right, uh, you have, for example, um, use cases where GANs are applied for detection of malware uh, with a lot of success. In malware detection, you have very, very, very few uh, events and the application of GANs have been quite successfully. So I think it's a thing to explore. So you have this, this tip from Fabiana, please try to explore this and make money. <laughs> at, at least a paper, va. Exactly, at least a paper. At least a paper. <laughs> there, there is no money in this. Yeah. Because bear in mind, you have a generative model and you have a discriminative, usually, at least one. You can have more, of course, but at least one of them. And both of them are potential of being used. We, ourselves, we are exploring the gener generative ones, but the discriminators are also very interesting. Have these approaches been compared to simpler methods like Smooth and Friends? For table of data, of course. Yes, I, I think I have mentioned something about this before. And yes, yes, they have. And in a lot of cases applied with a, a higher success rate. Uh, but again, it will depend a lot on the use case. It isn't here, but do you know about uh, training times between the methods? I know GANs usually take a lot of training time. Trains, uh, exactly for that reason. Um, and will depend a lot on the GAN architecture, also on the learning rates that you are selecting and other hyperparameters of the GANs. GANs can take a lot of time to train and will highly depend, of course, but will have a higher uh, training time when compared to these ones. And also in terms of, for example, your hardware, they also have specific requirements. So Smoot doesn't have those requirements. Uh, so it really depends Compromise. on the case. There is a trade-off there. And sometimes GANs are better and really the ones that can perform the task of augmentation, but some other times it might be a cannon for small fly. So I don't know. Uh, how many graphical cards do you have to process data? Well, that depends as well. But, A rough uh, number, 20, 30? <laughs> on my personal computer uh, and for small tasks of testing and so on, I'm just using one graphical card, but in cloud I'm, I'm using more. And it depends. But on my computer I'm using an R RTX 2070, yes, that's the one I'm using. That is quite powerful. How many? Yes, and it's quite good for even bigger data sets. It already does the job. So, so if you want wants to buy a GPU, Fabian recommends the 2070 <laughs> RTX. It's nice in terms of. Uh, and you can uh, also play video games with it. Yeah, <laughs> not that I'm a gamer, but yes, for those who like. <laughs> Your model supports statistical validation of fire moments and der derivatives of the data series. Yes. So yes. Yes, but I won't go much further on this because it uh, also already gets in, into our. Yeah. 
you yeah. don't use theoretical validation, you use the practical validation that is a correct firm for machine learning projects. Yeah. Can you share uh, where this model was used? Known companies that have used your services? Well, uh, I would rather not answer that question because a lot of the things yeah. are very specific to the company. Yeah. So, unfortunately, the, the the secret is the your is your business. So exactly. So, but uh, in terms of verticals, and I think that I can share in it might be oh. useful. We are working with a lot of uh, in terms of uh, energy sector and telco. So maybe I know some of your uh, companies. Maybe you know. <laughs> I have to question them. Have you been able to improve model performance with generated data? Yes. It depends on the use case, of course, but on the use cases that we are working, yes. This is an assumption that I'm making, but I, 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 I assume that uh, learning models will work better with synthetic data since you will use some type of noise that mm -hmm. the, the GAN will not mm -hmm. able to reproduce. Uh, is this the case? Usually the, the synthetic data produce better results. And when you plug in real data, the, the accuracy drops like 2% or 3%, something like that? Uh, not, not, not quite. Because, uh, and I will explain, although, yes, the, the random helps a lot, especially in, in for the synthetic data. What happens is the accuracies either are the same, exactly the same, or the synthetic data can be slightly less in terms of accuracy, but never uh, experience better um, accuracy in terms of the... But I want to leave here a very interesting topic that I think that you should all think. We have been talking about how the data and compare how equal is the synthetic data to the original one. But I think that Uber has brought us a very interesting um, a concept that we might not have thought about it, which is generating synthetic data that has nothing to do with real data. It, for the human eye, it seems like garbage, uh, but for the machines, it has higher improve, uh, as much better results in terms of the accuracy. This for computer vision, of course, for. Um, and besides the accuracy, it trains much faster. So really, are machines looking for something that looks like real in order to have results? Or are they looking for the patterns that really are important to them? I think that's that's a nice thing to think about it. If you are interested in C, I think those are the generative teaching networks. Have a look; they ha are quite interesting. So, Fabian, lends a challenge for us. Do you think <clears throat> that the GANs need the the real data or the relevant patterns that are already filtered by it? Maybe this will also provide a paper in the future. <laughs> we are almost at the end of the questions. Only two more. Does GANs have conversion issues? I think you. Yes, I think I have applied. Uh, yes. <laughs> they tend to collapse. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately. Yes. Unfortunately. Yes. What method do you use to select the stopping criteria for the training? This is oh. the last one. Yes, that will depend on the, um, the data set that we are working on, mainly. So no, no secrets revealed yet. We tried. I have to thank you for all the, the discussion that you had with us. I hope it was fun for you. It was indeed. I'm not saying goodbye right now because I have three more slides to, to share. I will try to share them now. I assume you all can see my presentation now. Again, I want to iterate, we have a call for proposals. If you know someone that will be a great speaker for us, or do you want to present your own work that you have produced uh, in your free time, or even in your company, if the company allows you to talk about it, please contact us. You have the links and the QR code here. Contact us and we'll uh, feature in the uh, webinar or if the situation allows it, 
in a, you have a physical presence in one of the meetups. We will also annoy you with a small survey to have the feedback uh, from these webinars. I want to point out this is especially relevant right now. This is the first webinar that we are making. We need your feedback to continuously improve. If you, if you like the YouTube uh, live stream, do you prefer Zoom? You don't want to use Zoom because of privacy issues. So please give us our honest feedback so you can improve our webinars and which will be our main uh, main uh, method to have meetups right now. We can't have presencial ones right now. And uh, I only want to say goodbye to Fabiana. Thank you for all your work. I think you can show us the, the other person that is with you. With you the he has been appearing in the video, hasn't yeah, he? Has, <laughs> he has been quite <laughs> nervous, I think, because yeah. he was moving. <laughs> He wants to Please. show up, you know. <laughs> Are you better Hi, now? What's up? <laughs> Are you better? You were quite nervous moving around in the in the park. <laughs> yes. See, everything is fine. Thank you both for the opportunity and and your insights in guns. And I thank you all for participating in this first webinar. I hope to see you again soon probably in, in May 7, and have a nice day. Keep safe in home. For Don't sure. do anything that, keep, that will harm you or the ones close to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Take care.